Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's lecture is going to be on periodontal flap. Now, you must have heard about uh, flap surgery. <clears throat> what is a flap surgery? A flap surgery is a surgery where we are raising a flap, a periodontal flap. The raising a section of the gingiva, that is, which consists of the epithelium and the connective tissue. Now, why do you want to raise this flap? You want to raise this flap so that you have access to the underlying root surface and the bone. So basically, we are going to discuss about what is a flap today? What are the various designs in flap? What are the incisions that we usually keep when we do flap surgery? Now, flap is nothing but it's a section of the gingiva and or mucosa which is surgically separated from the underlying tissues so as to provide visibility and access to the bone and root surface. So that is a basic idea of a flap. Right. Now <clears throat> you have different types of flaps. How do you classify these flaps? You can classify one based on bone exposure after flap progression. Now, if the bone is exposed or the bone is not exposed, so that is one classification. Second is where you finally place the flap and suture after your procedure. So based on placement of the flap after surgery. Third is how you manage the interdental flap. We'll go one by one. Now, based on bone exposure after flap progression. Now, when you reflect the flap, based on the thickness of the flap, you can classify the flap into two. One is called as the mucoperiosteal flap or the full thickness flap. And the other second type of flap is known as the partial thickness flap, or otherwise known as the mucoperiosteal flap. Now, whenever you need exposure of the underlying bone, what you do is you need a full thickness flap. So you are reflecting the gingiva along with the underlying periosteum. So you have three components there. You have the epithelium, then you have the underlying connective and then the periosteum that there. If all these three layers are being reflected, it is called as a full thickness flap. While now you, this full thickness flap you usually elevate using your periosteal tape. Now you can reflect another type of flap. That is, you are reflecting only the epithelium and part of the connective tissue. The rest of the connective tissue and the periosteum remain attached to the bone. This type of flap is called a split. You are actually splitting the gingiva, you are splitting the mucosa into two. And this is usually done like probably when you are doing a crown length and you want a finely displaced flap. Some other then do coverage procedures. So these are some of the things where you need partial thickness flap. Right? So these are the two ways by which you can classify flaps. I mean classify the flaps based on whether the bone is exposed or the bone is not exposed. So in a full thickness bone, the underlying bone is exposed. In a partial thickness flap, the underlying bone is not exposed. Only the epithelium and part of the connective tissue is being exposed. The rest of the connective tissue and the periosteum remain attached to the bone. <coughs> now, the next classification is based on the placement of the flap after surgery. Uh, you can uh, do a flap surgery procedure and then return the flap to its original position and suture it. Or you can displace the flap either coronally, like coronally, laterally, or apically. Okay. So when you place it in its original position, it's an undisplaced flap. When you are displacing the flap to laterally, apically, or coronally, it became a displaced flap. Depending upon which location you are displacing, you can name the flap. 
Then third is how you manage the internal platform. Now, when you are doing routinely doing a plant surgery, you put an incision on the labial aspect of the injera and then on the lingual aspect of the injera. So when you just consider one tapla, maybe the uh, the tapla inflation to the central incisors. Okay. So if you are if you are doing an if you want to reflect that area, so the labial aspect you are putting an incision. In the lingual aspect also you are putting an incision and then you are reflecting the the flap. So basically what what happens there is you are splitting the gingerba into two. Gingerba is split into the label and the lingual part. But in certain conditions, especially in conditions where the spacing between the two, where in the anterior aesthetic zone, you want to the interdental area that the plant has to be fully covered, you can design the flap in such a way that you can incorporate the entire papilla either on the buccal flap or on the palatal flap. That is called as papilla preservation flap. Now we'll just look into what is this papilla preservation. Now in a normal conventional flap, in a normal conventional flap, this is what we do. Now the, suppose this aspect is the labial aspect and this aspect is the lingual or the palatal aspect. Now you put trabicular incisions all around the two. So you put incisions all around the two. And this is your interdental papilla. In relation to the crested interdental papilla, you put a horizontal incision like that. So here also you put a horizontal incision. Here also you put an horizontal incision. So basically what you do is you reflect one half into this labial aspect and the second aspect into this lingual or the palatal aspect. So this half to this, this part goes to the labial aspect. This part goes, comes here. Okay. And the, this part comes down. This part comes down. And then after doing all the procedures, you bring it back. To the front. This is all as the conventional plan. You are just splitting the plan. Now what do you do in a papilla preservation flap? Now in a papilla preservation flap, you can see what is happening here. Now here, what you do is uh, similar to the other flap, you put trabicular incisions all around the tube. So it is all around the tube. And then instead of you putting a rose or horizontal incision here, you can put an incision, a semi lunar incision like this, semi, yeah, semi lunar incision like this, either on the label aspect or you can do it in the palatal aspect or the lingual aspect. Now, when you reflect this, this papilla, this papilla goes into the palatal aspect and this. Like here, this goes into the labial aspect. So, this is done whenever there is a lot of spacing between the two. So only when there is a good amount of spacing between the two, you do this because the entire papilla has to be incorporated properly and equally. There is too thin, the two need the two close together. There is always a chance that this papilla, this papilla will tear. So, you don't do it. You do it especially in anteriors. So, if you have a defect here and you Place a bone graft or things like that. This whole soft tissue to cover the entire interdental area. That is the basic idea of this papilla preservation flap. <coughs> so then, how do you design a flap? Before doing a flap surgery, you have to look at the clinical findings. You have to look at the radiographic findings. You have to look at all the different aspects of the systemic and other aspects of the patient. And then before the procedure itself, you have to plan the entire flap procedure. What type of flap, whether you are doing a full thickness flap or you are doing a partial thickness flap, whether you are coronally advancing the flap or if you are placing it there and there, whether you are doing anything to the bone or what type of sutures are being placed. Everything is going to be, you have to plan it for doing the procedure. Now, for doing flap surgery, 
basically you need for incisions. You know, these are integral part of a plant surgery. And how do you classify incisions? You classify incisions into what is the horizontal incisions and you have the vertical incisions, or otherwise known as oblique incisions. Now, what is a horizontal incision? A horizontal incision, you have mainly three types. Certain two, but three types. You have the internal bevel incision, the crevicular incision, and the interdental incisions. Now, what is an internal bevel incision? The internal bevel incision starts at the margin from the from the gingival margin, and it's aimed at the bone crest. And this internal bevel incision is also known as the first incision. Or a reverse pivot incision. And this type of incision is basic to most of the periodontal flap procedures. And it is made with a number 11 or a 15 blade. Now, this is an internal pivot incision. Now, internal pivot. Look at, look at this. This is made from the crest of the gingiva to, I mean, yeah, crest of the gingiva to this crest of the bone, right? The gingival margin to the crest of the bone. So, what you do is when you do put an incision like this and reflect this, and after putting the second incision here, this triangular part of tissue, now this forms a pocket lining. So, basically, you want to remove this pocket lining. That is a basic idea of doing. Uh, this is almost at 15 degree, 1 by 15 degree to the long axis of the tooth. We do this internal bevel incision. <coughs> now, this you can see. Now, when you're doing a bottom flap surgery, you can start from either right the, the midline or from the most distal aspect and you do it if this is an incision. So, this should have started from the look at the incision. It is an incision. About 0.5 millimeter from the gingival margin and it's directed between the base of the pocket and the crest of the bone. That is the basic idea of doing this incision. Now, suppose if you have a deep pocket of 4 millimeter here, okay, and if you want to completely remove the pocket, which you will be putting an incision somewhere here, not doing an adjustment. So, it will cause a lot of recession in said area. So, by doing this procedure, you even if the pocket is 6 millimeter or so, this will go inside through the thickness of the gingiva, 6 millimeter down, and it will remove only this soft tissue lining. So that is the basic idea of doing or rationale of doing this internal bone incision. So if you carry it like this, then you carry it around like this, like this, like this, like this. That is the internal table incision. <coughs> Objective, as I told before. It removes the pocket lining. It conserves the relatively uninvolved outer surface. So if you are doing completely removing the pocket, the whole of the gingiva is being it will be doing like a gingivectomy and you will remove the whole of the gingiva it becomes totally anesthetic, a lot of recession results. <coughs> and then it produces a sharp, thin flat margin so that it gets that margin gets closely adapted to the bone to junction. So these are the three objectives of an internal table incision. Now, the second incision is called as a crevicular incision. It is otherwise called as a second incision. It is otherwise called as the sulcular incision. You just take the blade and go all around the chest through the sulcus. So that is it. So this internal bevel incision along with your sulcular incision, that will result in a V-shaped tissue being detached. Okay. And this tissue contains the whole of the granulation tissue. And that is the basic thing. <coughs> you have first put an internal bit, first you first put an internal bevel incision like this here. And then you put an crevicular incision like this. So the, you this V shaped Area. This V shaped area means that is where the whole of the internal entry of feces tissue is. So here, this you put the internal table like this here. Now you are putting the crevicular. So this you will get a 
V-shaped <coughs> band of tissue there. That is what you're going to find. That is a that is a basic idea of giving the second incision. This third incision is otherwise called as interdental incision. Now these uh, the second incision does not the, I mean the first incision does not go interdentally. So so after the internal cable incision is being done, what you can do after the cavity incision is being done, you just reflect that part of the gingiva and then through interdentity, you place the open slide. Open is a spear shaped gingival knife to go in from the label aspect and then put it from the palatal aspect, which is the whole of the interdental area, that V shape, that tissue over there will come out. That is the basic idea of this interdental incision. So when you do all these three types of incision, the entire pocket lining around the core of the tooth is being removed. <coughs> yeah, then, then, then this 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 is not done in the labial or the lingual aspect of the tooth. This is done in the interdental aspect. Yeah. Now you have done the capillary incision like this. Would have done the then, uh, the circular incision, and now you reflect to the this thing here. If you have a cross this being reflected, and when you reflect like this, you get this. So, and here is where you insert your interdental knife into this interdental area. Okay, now this whole of the question is that is the basic idea. <coughs> These three incisions help in removing gingiva around the tooth. Okay, and then this the whole of the tissue is removed using a curette or using a U15 bar 30 scaler. That is a heavy sickle scaler that we use. And after that, after that, V band tissue is removed. All the granulation tissue can be removed. You can visualize the root surface thoroughly. All cancers, all deposits uh, that are present in the food surface, you remove it, and then you can switch. So that is the basic procedure of doing a flat surgery. Now, when you are giving only horizontal incision without any vertical incision, such a flap, it looks like an envelope. That is known as an envelope flap. So you have a flap which is being elevated only by means of horizontal incision without any vertical incision known as an envelope. Now, in certain conditions, you may need to you may need more of exposure of the bone. Sometimes you don't need to, sometimes the disease may be localized to one or two things where you want the entire whole organ may not be needed to be exposed. So in such conditions, you may put vertical incisions. Now, vertical incisions are incision that is put almost along the line, <coughs> line and of the tooth, I mean, along the long axis of the tooth. Okay. Sometimes you need to a bicular displacement part, the lateral displacement part. All these cases uh, you make the vertical but vertical incisions can be given on either side of the horizontal incision or maybe for axis you may be only in the mesial aspect, not doing the distal aspect of the part. If you can do sometimes you do on both aspects of the part. But you know there are there are certain uh, precautions that need to be taken when you do a vertical incision. Now, what are the precautions? Now, look, when you are doing an incision like this, you, if you have a papilla, you should not just split the papilla like this. Splitting the papilla is not the problem with like this. Okay, this will result in the recession. So what you can do is either you can. This is the area where they are reflecting the flap. So you can put an incision like this. You include this one. This is what they talk about. Include this one. Or suppose you can put the incision like this and exclude this one. So that is why you have to put the incisions. Now again, you should not on the put this part the tooth that that's more convex. You should not put an incision more convex because this too has to is the most common center. <coughs> the root may be prominent, the bone may be very thin, and the flap probably also is very thin in that area and you suture that area for longer distance chance that decision. So 
again you go to climax. So you cannot split the trachea, and you should not put an incision on the most convex aspect of the groove. So those are two things that is key. And another aspect when you give vertical incisions is vertical incision should be given in such a way that the base is wider. Okay, the base is wider because when the base is wider, you may have more of blood supply to that. That's where the base is. <coughs> now, <coughs> regarding sutures, now uh, after clap surgery, basically we have to do a sutures suturing. And, uh, in the mark, I think uh, this topic suturing is uh, taken for you during the surgery in your surgery classes. We'll just give, I'll just give you a basic idea. You can classify this uh, suturing materials into absorbable amounts of absorbable and absorbable. Non absorbable are, <coughs> they're not absorbable, they're what we call the patient for the one week or 10 days, and then you have to remove the suture. <coughs> you have number of uh, material that is available, but the commonly used material is silk. Braided silk is the most commonly used material. 3 0 braided silk is the material that we usually use for doing flat surgery. But you know, depending upon other types of surgery, like surgery or intermediate surgery, probably you may uh, like you may do a 3 0 line, 2 0, 5 0, 6 0, especially if you use a micro surgery or loops or something. Again, you may need <coughs> finer materials and finer suturing techniques. Again, a lot of synthetic materials are also available in the market, like polyglycolic acid, polyglyc capron, polyglyconate. All these are synthetic materials that are available in the market. <coughs> now, another thing that you should always remember is where you should take a bite when you do a suture. Now, when you imagine that you have reflected this whole area of flap, and now you want to want to suture. Now, what is this? You should consider this papilla as a triangle. Okay. And then just beneath this base, the center aspect, just perfect, I mean, line angle with this tip of the papilla. That is where you will take a bite. So that you take a bite here, but what is it? It's that this will, <coughs> it will pair, it will pair the flap to the basic edge. Now, there are different types of suturing. It is very difficult to uh, explain a suturing technique through a lecture. But what you basically do is you go back to your text. You make sure that you understand this suturing technique. This is a common suturing technique that you apply immediately after extraction. So, you do. You take a <coughs> on the buckle aspect, you take a bite. And then, in the lingual flap, in the, from the lingual aspect, you take Straight away, you take it out and then put a suture. This is called as a simple wound suture. But the common suture that we do in uh, periodontics is a finger or paste. The first bite is similar to that of the simple loop suture, that is from the buckle, you take a slice. But instead of taking a bite from the lingual aspect of the lingual flap, you take it from the palatal aspect, from the outer aspect. So both these are. From the outer aspect, and then you tie it's known as a figure of eight suture. And these are sling sutures. So, all these I'm not going to explain this. Basically, uh, you have to go to your textbook and preferably you have to practice this in models for you to understand different types of sutures. So, that is these are things uh, what we discussed here are basic. Things for doing a flap surgery, <coughs> like what are the <coughs> uh, what are the different types of flap? How do you classify flap? How do you classify incisions? What are the suturing materials that are involved? Hope uh, it was uh, informative for you.